Hello. In this unit, we're going to continue to talk about natural language modeling, uh, and we're going to talk in particular about recurrent neural networks, RNNs, um, which until recently were the main workhorse for language modeling. And when we want to talk about language modeling um, or language applications, the first thing we should talk about is word embeddings. So the idea is that if you're trying to model a sequence of words, and you're trying to feed a sequence of words into a neural network, what you need to do is represent or associate each word with a vector that represents it, and you feed that vector into the neural network. So what we're gonna have is an embedding matrix, and the first index of the embedding matrix, the row index is gonna be a word, and the, the second index is going to be a neuron index that gives us all the, the, the coordinates, the numbers in the word embedding vector. So if I write a lowercase w and an uppercase i, I'm talking about the vector over i. So this is the word embedding for the word w. It's just a way of writing w's word embedding. So you can view this matrix E as a dictionary that assigns each word a vector. Um, now, earlier in the beginning of, of deep, in the beginning of the deep revolution, people would tend to use pre-trained word embeddings. So you would train this uh, matrix using some really superficial language modeling objective. And that would give you um, a word embeddings that then you could use in your recurrent neural network model of language. Today, the more common approach is to just treat these word embeddings as parameters of the model. So we're going to learn the word embeddings as we're learning whatever our RNN or transformer model is. So this is a picture of an RNN. So this is a, a recurrent neural network. So this is the same, it's recurrent in the sense that this is the same machine, same parameters at every time step. So we're gonna have one machine with one set of parameters that we're using over and over again. That's different from the um, convolutional neural networks that are stacked in, in, in depth rather than in time where you have different independent parameters typically at each layer of the network. Here we have one system of parameters, one machine that's being repeated through time. And it's because it's the same machine, it can be carried on indefinitely in time. And um, this machine is, is appropriate for language modeling. So let's just go through that. So in language modeling, you're trying to predict, you're trying to assign a probability distribution over the next word given the previous words. So what's going to happen here is um, this machine, uh, let's put one in the middle, the machine, this machine is going to take the word embedding for the second word and the hidden state from the previous word and compute a new hidden state. Okay, um, if I want to predict uh, a probability distribution over this word, given the previous words, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this hidden state and use it via a softmax to generate the distribution over this. So that's this written as an equation. So in an autoregressive language model, we're putting a probability distribution on the next word given the previous words. And when we construct a probability distribution, we almost always do it with a softmax. So we're taking a softmax over the next word of the inner product of that word's word vector with the previous hidden state. And this equation is not specific to RNNs. So a transformer will use this same equation, right? So it's, it also produces a sequence of hidden states and it also predicts the next word from the previous hidden state. Okay, but they're very in, for an RNN, for a recurrent neural network, there are various kinds of machines, various flavors of machines. And the simplest one we'll just call a vanilla RNN. And you'll find that word used in PyTorch, vanilla RNN. So um, a vanilla RNN has sort of the simplest possible machine here. It's just, um, uh, we're gonna compute this hidden vector as the output of uh, one linear threshold unit. Each, each neuron here is just, each neuron in this vector um, each neuron J is computed as the output of one linear threshold unit. So that linear threshold unit takes two inputs. It takes, uh, let's, let's start here. It takes a hidden state from the previous unit and an input vector. So this is the hidden state from the previous unit. Um, 
I'm writing a capital I so that that's a vector. And this is a, a weight matrix that when we're multiplying this vector by that weight matrix by summing over the capital I. Okay, so that one input is the previous uh, hidden state. The other input is the current word. Um, and again, we're just, this is just matrix multiplication. It's just expressing matrix multiplication as summing over the vector, the vector index here and the appropriate index here. We take these two, um, we take these two uh, linear combinations, li um, linear sums, and compare them with a threshold and pass that through a um, activation function, threshold function. So that's the simplest possible machine. Okay, before moving on to other kinds of machines, I wanna talk about some issues. So we're, we're going through time um, and we're applying this machine over and over again. And uh, if, if this machine was just a linear transformation, and if you apply a, a matrix, a linear transformation again and again and again, you converge on the largest eigenvector. And then it grow, that, eigen, that eigenvector will grow exponentially in how long you, um, in time, and how long you go down that sequence. So uh, the values have, the, if, the, if the machine is amplifying values, the values grow, um, exponentially. If the machine is diminishing values, values shrink exponentially. So we talked about this um, in the last unit or in the unit on, on um, trainability. Um, the other thing that can happen is even if the values are balanced, when you do a back propagation, the, the, the gradients can explode. You can get, still get a gradient explosion problem when you do the back propagation through time. Um, so there's a standard trick, old trick, which is called gradient clipping. So, what we're, so how gradient, gradient clipping works is when you set the grad attribute of, a, of a, a weight matrix or a weight tensor, you look at the norm of that, assume this is a vector for the moment, you look at the norm of that vector and you compare it to some maximum allowed norm. And if it exceeds, if it's less than the maximum allowed norms, you just let it go. You, you use it like you normally do. But if it exceeds that, then you divide by the norm to force it to have this norm. And this, that applies to any tensor. And PyTorch contains this clip gradient primitive. OK. Now we have the issue of memory. So this is the issue of as we're going through time, what do these hidden states remember about the past? And this is really a trainability question because um, if I make this not just a one layer network, but a, a deep, you know, if I make this a five layer network that's generating this hidden state by a five layer MLP using these inputs, um, in principle, that's an extremely representative, it's, it's an extremely powerful architecture in terms of what it is capable of representing. However, it does not train well. So to, to make it train well, this, this is similar to what happens in convolutional neural networks when we introduce the residual connections. The residual connections allow information to flow directly from the low layers to the high layers. Now we want information to flow directly across time so what we're gonna do is we're gonna change the architecture such that it, it is more capable of, of, of passing information across time without, change, without changing it, just remembering it. Um, now this is, we don't, we don't really wanna use a residual connection for this. That might be a natural thing to try to do. Just take this, take this to be the sum of what you're computing here and the previous input. A difference here is that this is the same machine. These are not independent parameters. So the same machine is being used across time. And the question of what you remember and what you replace, that decision is made in the parameters of a, of a, of a layer of a CNN. What do I remember? What do I replace? Um, if we're going to use the same, the same parameters, we can't, we can't base that on the parameters. We have to compute what to remember and what to replace, a data dependent data flow. Whereas in the layered level, we have a, a layer dependent data flow. Here we want a data dependent data flow. Um, but it's, it's sort of the same intuition. 
we're looking for a way to pass information across time. So this is done with, with uh, what's generically called gated RNNs. And I'm going to start, I'm not going to follow history here. I'm going to start with the simplest possible gated RNN. And it turns out that um, simplicity rules and this simple model works essentially as well as all the more complicated models that came earlier. Complicated first, simple later. Um, so uh, this simple gated RNN is going to compute a gate. Um, and this gate, so here's the hidden, here's the, J, the hidden vector at the jth neuron. This is the jth neuron of the hidden vector. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make, uh, I'm gonna set this to, it's sort of like a residual connection. I'm going to use a sum between um, the previous hidden state. So I'm, so I'm going to pass directly in the previous hidden state, remembering it, plus uh, something that I just computed, like a, a residual step. Um, but instead of just adding them together, I'm going to use a convex combination. This gate is a number between 0 and 1 that decides whether this neuron should be remembered if this is one, which makes that zero, or replaced if this is zero and this is one. So this gate is computing remember or replace in a data dependent way. So um, here's the equations for it. So uh, we, we compute uh, a new value, this residual part, um, with a tan h, the tan h is an activation function that goes from negative one to one. It's just like the sigmoid, except it's scaled to go negative one to one instead of zero to one. And in RNNs, the, the tradition is that you think of the tan h as the newly computed data value, which is allowed to be negative. Um, so this is a newly computed data value. This is a gate. It's also computed by a two input uh, linear threshold unit. But this uses a sigmoid. That's, not a, that's not, now not a generic activation function. That's a sigmoid. So the new data value ranges between minus 1 and 1. The gate always is between 0 and 1. And then the equation I just had was I take um, the gate times the previous state plus 1 minus the gate times the newly computed value. So, th so the gate is deciding for each neuron separately and independently for each neuron separately and independently, do you remember it or do you replace it? And, and that gives the architecture the ability to just remember over long periods of time. Um, if, you re if you read a paper on this, <coughs> or many papers, there's this notation you should be aware of, which is Hadamard product, this circle with a dot in the middle. So the circle with a dot in the middle takes two vectors and, and computes the vector where the ith component of this vector is the product of the two ith components. It's component-wise multiply to produce a new vector. So I've just written that in the notation I'm using in this class, the Einstein notation. This is a vector over j. I'm taking these to be fixed. This is a vector over j. Hadamard, this vector over j. Um, so that means that um, uh, this is not summing over j. For each j, you're taking a product for that j. And the same here. So Hadamard means for each component, it's a product of that component resulting in a vector. That's just a notation you should be aware of. Um, so I'm going backward in time now. So before there was the simplest thing, there was the almost simplest thing called the GRU, the gated recurrent unit, although the word gated unit now, gated RNN now refers to anything in a large family of RNNs that involve gates. But here's the gated recurrent unit, the GRU. This part of the GRU is what I just showed you, sort of the simplest thing. But the GRU adds a gate um, before the tan H um, on the previous hidden state, which the other one did not. It just computed something that computed a tan H and then um, took a convex combination. Um, this is the long short term memory. This, this came first. 
This is Schmidt Huber, 1997, sort of real Gedunkin understanding of what, in some sense, of what needed to be done here. Um, it's much more, it's, it's significantly more complicated. All of these sigmas are gates. So the, one of these sigmas mean you, you take a um, linear threshold unit on each neuron, you pass it through the sigma and you multiply it with a Hadamard product times this to produce an, a gating of each, each neuron separately, deciding whether it gets gated or suppressed or not. Um, and similarly, there's a gating here. Um, these get added together. <clears throat> anyway, it's a complicated thing. The tan H is the, these two tan H's are the data path. The other thing about the long short term memory um, is it's got the, the hidden, it, this is the hidden state that gets passed along, but it also has this additional value that gets passed along inside, um, inside the, the pipeline of the RNN. So it's got a, a hidden value that it exports up the top and then two, and, and it passes on both the hidden value and another internal value. And the LSTM was the dominant, this was really the dominant um, gated recurrent unit uh, for, for, for some years. Um, there was this study done in 2016. Um, the UG RNN is the simple one that I just showed you, the simplest one that I started with. Um, so this was all happening early in the deep revolution. Um, and this paper claims that the GRU is the most learnable of the LSTM, the GRU, and the, the simplest thing. Um, but the simplest thing was essentially as good. Um, now, it's, it's possible now in, in EDF or in a framework, it's possible to write a procedure that's sort of generic as to what the cell is of the, um, of the RNN. So I can take an arbitrary RNN cell with an arbitrary parameter set um, and pass it in as arguments, um, the previous hidden state vector and the current word embedding. That should be an E, I think, or it should be an E. Um, and for any such cell, you can write a recursive procedure that turn, that computes an RNN from that cell, from that box that just gets repeated across time. And now there are sort of fairly obvious um, things you can do. So one thing you can do is uh, you can compute the hidden states left to right, and you can compute the hidden states right to left. And that gives you sort of a symmetry between the two directions. And then I can take the hidden states that I get left to right and the hidden states that I get right left, right to left and concatenate them. You know, um, take all the components of one followed by all the components of the other and use that out the top uh, for language model. I you can't use it for language modeling because you're looking backward in time, but you can use it for other things like machine translation. Um, yeah. The other thing you can do is you can stack uh, the RNNs. So rather than making the, the box contain a deep multi-layer perceptron, you make each one of these boxes simple, like a one-layer multi-layer perceptron, and, but you stack the RNNs such that, that um, you've got your input words, you've got a, a, a simple one-layer multi-layer perceptron uh, RNN here, then you take those hidden states coming out of there and feed them into another RNN layer, and you can stack this arbitrarily deep. So um, this was sort of an architecture that appeared at some point, and then residual connections became popular, and people started to understand that everything should be residual connections. So this stacking got replaced with vertical residual connections. I mean, these, these layers now have their own parameters. Right, so go, when you go up the stack, you're getting different parameters at every layer. So the residual connection makes more sense because the decision of what to remember and what to replace um, now can be made in a layer specific way um, because the parameters of, each, of the layers are different. Whereas across time, you're always using the same parameters. And so here, this is just the equation for um, 
uh, a, resi a, a stack of RNNs stacked with, re with residual connections. So the stack is open. So, so this uh, script L here is referring to the layer, how deep you are in the stack. And you're saying that um, the layer, this whole tensor <clears throat> at time T and J for this layer is equal to the tensor at the previous layer plus uh, the tensor that results from applying RNN to the previous layer. So this is a residual connection, right? It's just saying um, the next layer is the previous layer plus something you computed from the previous layer. And that's RNNs. And uh, we will soon do transformers. Transformers have largely now replaced RNNs. Um, and we'll get started on attention, which is attention is a prerequisite for transformers. In the next unit, we're going to start talking about attention and how it arose and the transformer. Um, thank you.